So here's a little bit of the science in this area. These are basically studies where they've taken people and put them on low calorie diets, almost always low in fat, so low fat, low calorie diets, okay? And in some of these studies, they've also got them to exercise as well, okay? So here's a summary of the evidence, basically. If you look on the left-hand column, this is the length of the study, and then how long after they did the study that they looked at them again, and what the overall weight loss was. One of the most interesting ones, actually, is the one third line down, where it says 24. So they did this intervention for 24 months, okay? And, uh, and so there was no, like, follow-up as such. It was just one long study. If you look, though, at the average weight losses in these studies, you'll see that when they changed their diet alone, uh, they lost an average of uh, two kilograms, basically, which is about four and a half pounds, okay? Uh, and if they added exercise to that, and that was very often about sort of 45 minutes, three or four times a week. This is quite a lot of aerobic exercise. Sometimes they used a little bit of resistance in there as well. They lost about three kilograms, which is about six and a half pounds, okay? And you might say, well, it's better than nothing, okay? But actually, when you think about how much work and effort went into this, okay, and the fact that these people, excuse me, started out at about sort of, you know, the you know, 230 pound mark usually, that was the sort of average weight in these studies, then you begin to realize this is an unmitigated failure, okay? There's no other way to explain or to describe that in my view. It is a failure, okay? Now, also in these studies, let me just bear this in mind. The people in these studies were not working on their own, okay? They had an enormous amount of support generally. So they're attending group session, one-to-one -one dietary sessions, okay? They've got motiva people motivating them in group exercise or motivating them to do their exercise on their own. They've had a lot of intervention. And look at the results. They are appalling. So what normally happens when people fail applying the calorie principle? Here's my experience. Usually there's a sort of judgment around this. It must work, right? Calorie principle must work. <coughs> Eating less calories than you burn must work. So if it hasn't worked for you, there's something wrong. And what's wrong is either you've eaten too much or you haven't exercised enough, okay? Or you're a bit weak-willed and you lack self-control and you've got an inadequate personality, right? <laughs> and here's the thing, right? A lot, of these, a lot of the time, people apply these judgments internally to themselves, right? So they're not even just external. For a lot of people, they think this must work. So if it hasn't worked for me, there's something wrong with me. And I might have, therefore, a weak will, a lack of self-control, in an, an, and an inadequate personality. Now, these things may be true. <laughs> I have met a lot of people that you could possibly label, that, label with that accusation. However, that isn't necessarily why the thing hasn't worked, okay? Maybe there's something else going on. So let's have a look and see what it is about the calorie principle that doesn't quite stack up, okay? So I'm going to go through a fair amount of detail here relatively quickly, and then I'm going to tell you what works better, all right? So here's the first thing, okay? If you eat, it's a bit like putting fuel on a fire. So what happens when you don't put so much fuel on the fire? Well, the fire doesn't burn so well. So one thing we know absolutely categorically is that when people eat less, it puts a bit of a dent in the metabolism, okay? It puts a break on the metabolism, all right? And uh, this is through a number of different mechanisms, several mechanisms, including things like thyroid hormone changes, changes in horm the hormone leptin, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, also, studies in animals and humans show that when people restrict calories, okay, one of the things that happens is that they move less, they spontaneously move less, okay? Now, there's probably uh, another mechanism that might be going on here around nutrient depletion, because when people eat a low calorie diet, very often, to be honest, they're eating rubbish, okay? And if you get nutrient depleted, you're eating less and they're eating rubbish, and so if you get nutrient depleted, then you don't necessarily have the nutrients that you need to keep your metabolism going at full tilt, okay? And there is a bit of indirect evidence here because they did a study on weight loss in women where one group got a placebo, the other one got a multivitamin and mineral, and it speeded weight loss significantly just doing that, okay? Which makes me think this is possibly a mechanism in here. But by the way, the very fact that, you know, when people go on a low-calorie diet and they become very calorie-obsessed, I have noticed, okay, as a result of that, people will tend to eat any old rubbish, like low-calorie foods that are very dubious. And, um, and this can also happen, I know this is slightly contentious, with people that are eating a low-carb diet. Just because something is low in carb doesn't make it necessarily healthy. This carpet, you know, is low in carb. <laughs> 
This reminds me of something, by the way. I'm going off at a tangent slightly, but <clears throat> baked potatoes, right? I'm sure it's the same in the States as in, in the UK. These are like icons of healthy eating, but actually they're very disruptive to blood sugar. I'm not saying you shouldn't eat them, but if you're, if you're wanting to stabilise blood sugar levels and... Uh, optimize, say, your weight and health, they're probably not something to be eaten in too large an amount, okay? But why do people believe that baked potatoes are healthy? Because they're low in fat and high in fiber. Well, this carpet is low in fat and high in fiber, okay? And when someone looks at me quizzically, I say, well, here's another thing that's low in fat and high in fiber. Dog shit. Dog shit is low in fat. <laughs> because sometimes I've noticed in practice, right, you have to say things like this to get someone's attention. And then I'll say something like, and it's also zero cholesterol and fresh. <laughs> yes. OK, so, um, so what happens when we put a dent in our metabolism this way? Lots of things can happen. But basically, it can make weight loss really slow going, right? This is the original slow burn, Fred Hahn. OK. Um, also, um, it can basically cause people to plateau at a weight way above the weight that they were hoping to get to, all right? And then at this point, okay, they're still eating less, they're probably exercising more as well, and they're not really getting anywhere, so they yeah, usually default back to their original diet. And the weight usually goes on very quickly because now, now they've got this sort of dwindled metabolism, okay? So this is a major, major problem for people, and it happens very, very regularly. Now, is this a new thing? Well, apparently not, because this was actually studied quite a long time ago. So there's an experiment. Has anyone heard of the Minnesota experiment? Okay. Now, the Minnesota experiment um, was uh, done at the end of the 1940s. So after the Second World War, quite a lot of people had suffered um, basically from starvation or semi-starvation. And um, <clears throat> there were some people that were interested in how you would get these people to regain their weight as healthily as possible. So they decided to starve people and then get them to regain their weight, okay? So these are a group of men, okay? Uh, and this um, study was actually administrated. The lead uh, um, a researcher was someone called Ansel Keys. Please don't recoil in horror, okay? <laughs> the, the, stu the study was uh, fair enough, okay? It's probably the, the, the most uh, important study we have, I think, in this area. And basically what they did was they got these men, and for 24 weeks they got them to eat what they described as a semi-starvation diet, which is 1,600 calories, by the way. Okay, uh, but it was a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet, as we're generally uh, recommended to eat. So what happened? Well, overall, weight went down by 20 to 26 percent. Okay, that's all right. Okay, I mean they were emaciated, and they, and as I'll tell you in a moment, they weren't doing so well. But actually, overall metabolism went down uh, by almost 40 percent. Okay, so the me metabolic um, reduction was even bigger than you would predict. Uh, as a result of the amount of weight that these people had lost, okay? Now, that doesn't look so good, and worse than that, these men, okay, really suffered at the hands of this diet. I mean, most of them were perpetually thinking about food. Anyone had that before? <laughs> okay. Perpetually thinking about food, obsessing about it, thinking about nothing else, having no interest in anything else, so they lost their interest in their families and friends and sex and all sorts of stuff, okay? Uh, they lost their senses of humour. They, they, a lot of them were chewing gum and drinking coffee incessantly. Hmm. Anyone here done that on a, di on a, on a diet, okay? Um, and then what they did, basically, is that at the end of the experiment, they let them eat as much as they like, basically. I'm summarising this, this year-long study, but this is what they basically did. And not surprisingly, some of those men ate food voraciously, uh, up to about 4,000 calories a day. So they're stuffing this food in their faces. And what they found out subsequently, looking at the data, is that their appetite seemed to be related to fat sort of levels in the body. And as their fat levels came up again, okay, their appetite came down. 